him. If you take your bulletin and you find that center section, I want you to read with me this passage of Scripture from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is a great passage. Thanks, Tim. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Would you read it with me, please? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. All of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and then gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Father, this idea that you have entrusted to us the ministry of reconciliation. How incredibly awesome is it that we would be your ambassador, that we would represent you to the world, that the world would come to know the beauty and greatness of who you are through us. Father, that's pretty humbling. And so we ask today as we approach the Scriptures that you would use the Word of God to teach us, to refine us, to train us in righteousness about how we carry out this calling. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. So we are still in the stories of Exodus. If you've got your copy of Scripture, Numbers chapter 20 is where we're at. We are coming towards the end of the story, not the end of the sermon series, don't get your hopes up, but the end of the story. Uh, they have, Moses has led the people out of Egypt. They've crossed the Red Sea. They've come to Sinai. They've entered into a covenant with him. They have come to the edge of the promised land, Kadesh Barnea. They sent in the spies. The spies said there's giants in the land. There's no way God can give that land to us. And as judgment for that, the, this generation, the generation that saw God's signs, that saw God's wonders, that crossed the Red Sea, that generation, that adult generation is going to wander through the wilderness for 40 years until that generation passes away. And the next generation is going to be the generation that God takes into the land of promise. So where we are in the story at Numbers 20 is we are at the end of that wilderness wandering. It's kind of interesting that there's not a whole lot of stories in Scripture that actually deal with the 40 years. Uh, this is one of them at the end of that. So at this point in the story, basically that previous generation is, is dying out. And the younger generation is, is growing up and getting ready to go into the land of promise. Also, Moses is uh, getting up there in age. <laughs> so the first 40 years of his life, he would grew up in the palace under Pharaoh. The next 40 years of his life, he was in the wilderness in Midian. Uh, and then after the burning bush, the last 40 years of his life, he's been leading this group of people out of, out of Egypt. So he's pushing about 120 years old. So I don't know what your definition of an old man is, but I think that's probably up there. So he's kind of... Uh, at, at the end, personally, he's at the end of this journey. This chapter is kind of a sad chapter uh, because lots of things come to an end. This is the chapter we find out that Miriam dies. Uh, Miriam, the sister of Moses, the one who watched over Moses floating down the river, the one who was a prophetess of Israel, the one who led in worship when they crossed the Red Sea. Mo uh, Miriam will die. We'll also find out that Aaron died. Aaron's the brother of Moses. Aaron's the mouthpiece. Aaron is the, the priesthood, goes through his line. Uh, Aaron will pass away as well. And then this is the chapter that we find out where Moses himself will not be allowed to enter into the promised land. Now, most of you probably knew that before we started Exodus, but if you didn't, sorry, spoiler alert, uh, Moses does not get to actually go into the land of promise. And this is the chapter that we find out why. This is the story where that takes place. Uh, and so let's look and see 
uh, what it is that Moses did. I, I want us, though, to read this story, not just trying to figure out what did Moses do that was so bad that got him a limb kicked off the island, so to speak. I mean, what, what, what did he do that was so bad that made God so upset that you don't get to go in the land of promise? I, I want us to read it through the lens of 2 Corinthians 5. You know, Moses' role with the congregation really was, he was representing God to the people. He was God's ambassador to the children of Israel. Uh, And so he represented them, and we're going to see in this particular moment where he fails to represent God well. And what I hope to happen today is that we can learn from that as we are ambassadors for Christ. God has given to us the ministry of reconciliation, and how is it that we represent God well and how we can learn uh, from that story. So, uh, Numbers chapter 20, let's just read through this here, beginning verse 1. And the people of Israel... The whole congregation came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. So you realize where we are in the story. We have come full circle. It was Kadesh Barnea where the spies were sent in, and so it's the forefathers of this group of people who came to this very spot and decided we can't believe when they can't trust the Lord to take us in the promised land that we've been wondering for 40 years. They've come back to this very same spot as a new generation, which just reminds us that each new generation must forge their own faith in Christ. We cannot depend upon borrowed faith. Just because grandmother was a Christian doesn't mean that you're a Christian. You've got to decide and put your faith. And just, you're not, you're also not uh, doomed to the unbelief of the previous generation. Just because your parents did not follow Christ does not mean that you never will. You, you've got to make that choice. So they've come to Kadesh, this new generation, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness, that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines or palm granites, and there is no water to drink. Um, I know this doesn't surprise you. They come to a place where there's a crisis, and they begin to grumble. And that's pretty shocking. You haven't seen that in the story yet. There's ten times in the Exodus Numbers narrative where specifically the people grumble. This is time number nine. We'll get to read time number ten next week. Uh, So we're familiar with this, same kind of, but you notice in verse 5, there's a new element there, and they're grumbling. We've heard them say before, we should have just died in the wilderness, we should have stayed in Egypt, why did you bring us out? We've heard all that before, but you notice in verse 5, you brought us to this evil place, there's no grain or figs or vines or palm granites. Do you remember Numbers 13, when the spies went into the land of promise, and they bring back, do you remember what they bring back? Cluster of grapes, which grow on a vine. And it also says they brought back figs and palm grants. So basically, they're accusing Moses. Why haven't you brought us into the promised land? Why are we still out here in the wilderness? This place is an evil place. Why haven't you brought us in yet? Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting, and they fell on the places, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Now, we, we've seen this story before. The people grumble. Uh, God gets mad. God says, stand back. I'm going to wipe them all out. Moses intercedes. God mitigates his wrath, and then God provides, and we move on. We've played that story out before, which incidentally is really just kind of a foretaste of the gospel story. We are sinners. We deserve God's wrath. Jesus intercedes for us. The wrath is satisfied, and the covenant is restored. But notice uh, something different happens here. So Moses and Aaron go to the presence of the assembly, the the entrance of the tent of the meeting, they fall on their places, the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff, assemble the congregation, you and Aaron your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water, so you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. Now, deja vu, some of you are thinking, hey, I think we've heard this story before. Well, you have. Exodus 17, right as when they come out of the land of promise and they cross the Red Sea, the very same thing happens. They get to a place and there's no water. And in that story, they grumble and God comes to Moses and says to take, take the rod, take the staff to go. And God actually says to Moses, I will stand on the rock before you. And that you are to take the staff and you are to hit the rock 
and then out of the rock will come water. So it's very similar, but notice the differences. Here, he says, take the staff, assemble the congregation. Exodus 17, he just assembled the elders. Here he gets the entire congregation. And then you and Aaron, your brother, tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. In all of the miracles that Moses does in the wilderness or coming out of Egypt, in all of those miracles, God never told Moses to, to speak. Usually he did something. He poured out water, turned to flood, he raised his staff, you know, something. This is the first time that God's actually telling him to speak. So this is, this is a difference from Exodus chapter 17. But notice what's happening different from the story. The story we're used to seeing is the people grumble, God gets very angry, Moses intercedes. But notice there's no real anger of God here. There's no hint of wrath, there's no hint of judgment, there's no hint of frustration, there's no hint of, I can't deal with these people anymore. He just simply says, Moses, take the staff, assemble the people, speak to the rock, water will come forth, and they will water the congregation and their crops. So verse 9, Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank in their livestock. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and through him he showed himself to be holy. So Moses gets to that situation, and remember, God did not, God did not tell him to say anything to the people. He was supposed to speak to the rock. Moses instead speaks to the people, you rebels. You know, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? As if it was the people's request asking them, hey, can you bring us water out of the rock? Now, this was God's idea. God told Moses to do this, but Moses kind of turns it on his head. You rebels, shall we bring water out of the rock? And then he strikes the rock twice. He doesn't speak to the rock like God commanded him to do. He strikes the rock twice. And the story wouldn't be so bad if it ends with verse 11. You know, if it just kind of ended there and Moses said, Oof, you know, messed up, goes back to his tent, gets a glass of cold water and, you know, kind of calms down a little bit and then we move on with the story. But there is verse 12. And verse 12 is very clear. The Lord said to Moses, because you did not believe in me and to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people, you will not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. So the question as you read this story is what did Moses do that was so bad that it caused him to, to not be able to enter into the land of promise. I mean, after all that Moses had put up with and after all that Moses had done in obedience to God, what happens here that is, that is so bad that Moses can't go into the land of promise? Bible scholars love this question. They've been writing about it for a long time. In the year, eight, I saw a quote from a guy, 1871, one Bible scholar wrote, The exegetes have piled off on Moses 13 sins and more. Each one of them has invented a new sin. I can tell you from reading commentaries, there's a whole lot more than 13 out there now. All these theories about what Moses actually did wrong. And instead of chasing all those down, I just invite us to look at verse 12. Because verse 12 gives us the answer to that. Because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. I want to add to that verse 24. So verse 24 is in, surrounding the death of Aaron which happens right at the same time, let Aaron be gathered to his people, for he shall not enter the land that I have given to the people of Israel because you rebelled against my command at the waters of Meribah. So as we're trying to figure out what did Moses do wrong, we get these three things. He did not believe in me, he did not uphold me as holy, and you rebelled against my commands at the water of Meribah. So let's just take a moment to look at those. Again, we're not just trying to figure out, hey, what did Moses do wrong? But we're trying to learn from that because just like Moses was an ambassador representing God to the people, we've been called to that as well as representative of Christ to the people that God's called us to. So what can we learn, learn from Moses? So the first sin of Moses is this idea that, that, that Moses and both, they uh, disobeyed the commands of God. They rebelled against the commands of God. 
God was pretty clear. Speak to the rock. And Moses didn't do that. He hit the rock and he spoke to the people. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, most of us would look at that and say, that's kind of a minor infraction. Like, that's kind of five yards. That's not like, you know, 15 yards ejection kind of thing. This is just kind of a minor infraction. Uh, And if you and I were the attorney of Moses, I think we can make a pretty good case for that. Exodus 17, you told me to hit the rock. You were okay with it then. Why aren't you okay with it now, right? We could probably make a pretty good case of uh, entrapment. I mean, you told him to take the rod. What do you think he was going to do with the rod? It's like if you give a two-year-old a hammer, (laughs) you know, he's going to hit something with a hammer, right? I mean, so maybe God's entrapment here, taking the rod. Uh, We might be able to argue that it's kind of a victimless crime. Is it really that big of a deal? I mean, water came out anyway. Everybody got to drink. What's the big problem? Uh, But the problem is, from God's eyes, is disobeying the commandment that God had given to Moses was rebellion. You're rebelling against my commandments. And as much as we want to try to justify it and put sugarcoat on it and say it's not that really that big of a deal, what we see is for, for the individual who's representing God to the people to disobey God's commandments and to rebel against God's commandment, that is testifying about God to the people. What we're really saying to the people is God's really He's really not that sovereign. He's really not that much of a king. He's really not that much of in charge. He kind of gives commands, but they're really advice more than they are commands. You know, it, that's, it's diminishing the holiness of God by treating his word so cavalier. And God holds Moses up to this very high standard. I told you specifically what to do. I told you to speak to the rock, not to hit the rock. Verse John 5, this is the love of God. We keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. So his first sin was he disobeyed and rebelled against the commands of God. The second sin is he didn't believe in God. That's verse 12, because you did not believe in me. Your translation may say trust. Remember, this was the first time that God commanded Moses to speak in the execution of a miracle instead of just doing something. So maybe Moses' problem, maybe what he didn't believe was that, I don't know, maybe God, that God was able to bring water out of the rock or that God was able to use his voice to bring water out of the rock. But notice the text does not say, you did not believe that I could bring water from a rock. It doesn't say, you didn't believe that your voice had enough power to bring water from the rock. The text just simply says, you did not believe in me. You didn't trust in me. And so often what trust and belief comes down to is whether or not God is going to do what he said he's going to do and trusting in the way in which God says, I'm going to do what I want to do. Both of those are a challenge for us to trust and fully believe that God's going to be able to bring water out of a rock and that he's going to do it the way he said he's going to do it by me speaking to that rock. And God's saying to Moses, you just didn't believe in me. You didn't trust in my, what I said I would do nor the way in which I said I would do it. So he didn't believe. Remember Hebrews 11, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Third sin there in verse 12 is you did not uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel. This word holy means to be set apart. It means to be wholly different. I think it's interesting in verse 13 because it says, These are the waters of Meribah where the people of Israel quarreled with the law. And then notice that last phrase, And through them he showed himself holy. So through this experience, God demonstrates to the people that he is holy. So just maybe think this week, okay, so what what exactly, how exactly did Moses not uphold God as holy and how did God demonstrate his holiness through giving water through the rock, even though Moses disobeyed and he struck the rock instead of speaking to the rock? It made me think of a couple of things. I think we can say that that Moses failed to demonstrate the holiness of God by, by disobeying what God told him to do. Again, by, by ignoring God's word, it diminishes the holiness and the sovereignty and the role and the place of God in our submission to him. So that, that in of itself did not uphold God as holy. But I think there's also something to this idea that part of the way that Moses failed to uphold the holiness of God was he was not upholding the grace and mercy of God. Um, In a a way, Moses failed to represent the grace and mercy of God to the people. Moses had the great opportunity for a speech. 
This is, this is how my speech would have gone if I were Moses at that moment. I would have gathered the people together and I would have said, you know, for the last 40 years I have watched you ingrates grumble about everything. Right? There's no water. We don't like the manna. We want meat. Blah, blah, blah. And I have watched you complain about everything. And I would think God had had enough of you. But I just came from the tent. And as much as I don't understand it, God loves you grumbling people. And he wants to meet your needs. I know, it is strange. And so what he told me to do was to gather you together. And it wasn't for fire to fall from heaven or for snakes to be released or from fire to burn the edge of the camp. That's what I wanted to do, but that's not what he wanted to do. He told me to gather you together and I'm supposed to speak to the rock and water is going to come forth. Now, we've seen some crazy things for the last 40 years, haven't we? Walked across dry land on the Red Sea. We've seen manna every morning. We've seen some really crazy things, but you know what we've never seen? You've never seen me speak to a rock and water flow out. What that means is you and I are going to be the first to witness a brand new display of God's love for you and his commitment to provide for you. So all together, would you say with me as we say to the rock... I mean, that's a great speech, right? What does Moses do? You rebels. Shall we bring water for you? You don't deserve it. That wasn't God's heart at all. No wrath, no anger, no judgment. He simply says to Moses, take the rod, gather the people, speak to the rock. Water will come forth and I will meet their needs. He fails as an ambassador to demonstrate to the people God's grace and God's mercy and God's love. So again, not just to criticize Moses and see what Moses did wrong, but we're trying to learn from our, ourselves. Second Corinthians 5 says we are ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal through us to the world that God has sent us for them to be reconciled to God. And that is that is risky business. That was a risky game plan on God's part to, to use us to be his ambassadors. That was a risk. And, it, and it's, I mean, it's burdensome for us. Some of the people that, that you work with or that we know or live next to or in our family, the only thing they will ever know about Jesus is how we represent Jesus to them. And that's a pretty significant burden to carry, that we are ambassadors for Christ. So what can we learn from this moment where Moses failed that we can try to be better trained in righteousness? So just going back to these three sins, first one, it reminds us that if we're going to be ambassadors for Christ, we need to obey the commandments of God. Um, When it talks about obeying God's commandments, you know, this is not for unbelievers. Um, Unbelievers don't follow Christ, and so they don't follow the commands of Christ, and that's not a real shock because they're not a followers of Christ. But for those of us who identify with Christ, we are Jesus people. We have surrendered to the Lordship of Christ. Now it is upon us to obey the commandments of Christ, and it's our obedience to the specific commandments that God has given to us that upholds uh, the holiness and the place of God. And so often, some of the commandments with God that God gives to us are the commandments that are are easy for us to justify and to rationalize away, just like Moses could. You were okay with me hitting the rock 40 years ago. It's not really going to make that much of a difference. Just bring water out. What's the difference? God gives us commandments, and we do the same thing with with those commandments as well. But if we're going to represent God to the world, and we're going to represent a God who is sovereign who has authority over everything, who one day will make all things new that we are looking forward to, and every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess. If that's the God we are trying to represent and be an ambassador, if we are disobeying his commandments, then we are belittling the God that we claim to represent. So let me just ask you this morning, is there a commandment that God has given to you that you're resisting obeying because you think it really doesn't matter or it's too small or it's too insignificant? Until we come to grips with that and we confess that and submit to that and repent of that, our ambassadorship is at risk. 
Second sin of Moses was this whole idea of trust and believing in God's promises and in God's ways. Not only that God will do what he said he will do, but God works in the way that God works, which we have to realize is God's ways are not of this world, right? Scripture says, do not overcome evil with evil, but we overcome evil with good. Well, the ways of this world, that which makes sense to us, is to overcome evil with evil, with more evil, with more power. No, we are to overcome evil with good. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. It does not say do unto others as they have already done to you. That's the way the world operates, but God's way is a different way. Do unto others the way that we would have them do unto us. Lean not on your own understanding. That's the way the world operates, but God's means and God's way is different. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Uh, and so you think about it, if, if we are wanting to be an ambassador for Christ and we're wanting other people to put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ, both in his promises and in his ways, and yet we're not doing that, then it's very, we are misrepresenting the, the God that we are, have been called to be an ambassador for. And then that last sin of, of Moses, upholding God as holy in the eyes of the people. You know, if part of a, an ambassador is to declare the grace and the mercy of and God's love for sinners. Um, there, there is, there's probably a part of all of us that really would just rather run through the streets and say, you rebels, right? That we share that heart of the disciples that said to, Mo, to Jesus, you know, do you want us to call down fire from heaven? Let's just roast these people. I mean, there's, there's a part of us. And yet, as ambassadors for Christ, it is proclaiming the good news of God's grace and God's mercy and God's love for sinners. So you go back to that 2 Corinthians 5. He gave to us the ministry of reconciliation. Well, what's the ministry of reconciliation? Verse 19. Number one is that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. That's the first part of that. The second part of that ministry is he was not counting their trespasses against them. Matter of fact, uh, verse 21, that's the whole reason he sent Jesus, so that Jesus could bear their sins so that they can become righteous through him. So it, it's in Christ, God's reconciling the world, not counting the trespasses against him, and now we have that message of reconciliation. And so as, as much, uh, many of our times as we want to, to scream judgment and to scream fire upon those who, who don't know Jesus, we need to make sure as ambassadors for Christ, we are doing a good job proclaiming that message, God loves sinners. God loves sinners so much. Your memory verse for this past week, John chapter 3, right? God so loved the world that he what? He sent his son so that whoever believes in him might not perish but can have everlasting life. He did not send the son into the world to condemn the world. Why? Well, the world was already condemned by sin. He sent the Son into the world that the world might be saved through him. That's the good news, the message of recon reconciliation. As ambassadors, we have that good news to share. God loves sinners. Instead of roaming around, you rebels, roam around and say, there is good news. God loves sinners. Would you pray with me for just a moment?